Right now on Morning News Now, frustrations and failures. Nearly two years after the Uvalde mass shooting, this morning, loved ones of the 21 victims shot and killed at Robb Elementary, bracing for the results of the federal investigation. Plus, Attorney General Merrick Garland in Uvalde ahead of the report's release. Later today, we will have the latest. Also this morning, much of the country frozen over in a coast-to-coast -coast winter blast. This as we track two separate storm systems now on track to merge later today. Plus, it's not just humans feeling the freeze. We're going to share tips on how to keep your pet safe in winter weather. And a disorder in the court as E. Jean Carroll takes the stand in the defamation trial against Donald Trump. The former president going from the courtroom to the campaign trail days before the New Hampshire primaries. We're going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country. We will bring you the latest and a junk fee face-off. The Biden administration taking on big banks over expensive account overdraft fees. The new proposal that could help save you some money. That is something I think everyone has yeah. experienced, so they're going to be it's eager so to hear that maybe there could be some solutions. Good Love morning. It. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being here. We're going to get started this morning in New Valde, Texas. Today, the Justice Department is expected to release the findings of its investigation into the mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. Justice Department officials have said the review will focus on the law enforcement response to the shooting. In 2022, a panel of state lawmakers found that nearly 400 officers responded to the shooting, but then waited more more than an hour to confront the gunman. And all 19 students and two teachers were killed in the tragedy. For more, we're joined by NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley. Ryan, uh, good morning. So what can you tell us about this report? Are we expected to learn anything new here? You know, so essentially this uh, investigation in DOJ Jay's eyes can have they can sort of speak broadly to this issue and have an impact not only there but hopefully they think um, on you know nationwide. So essentially, if you look at other investigations at the Justice department that there are basically principles that you could take and take, learn lessons from to try to stop this from happening in the future. You've seen that in Ferguson. You've seen that uh, in Baltimore. Now, those investigations were focused more broadly on police practices. And this investigation is really kind of focused on just what happens in this individual sort of shooting circumstance, how they should have responded, how, what they could have done differently. And they're hoping that other law enforcement agencies uh, will take heed to that and learn lessons from this report so that this sort of Thing is Ryan, let's talk through what could come of this. We've already seen several of the officers involved lose their jobs. That includes Uvalde's school police chief, P. Arandondo. Could we see more firings or maybe even any kind of charges here? I think, you know, the focus of this is going to be sort of on the princi the principles. This isn't a criminal investigation. This is not, you know, something the Justice Department normally does all that often. This is something that is just more focused on sort of trying to prevent this from, uh, from happening going forward. This is an investigation that, you know, is run by, is essentially an investigation not run with a criminal, you know, looking for criminal intent, but rather looking for implications and how this could be done differently um, in the future to see if there can be some lessons learned here to make sure uh, that, you know, other law enforcement agencies are more prepared for these circumstances going in because we really, you know, th there have been some sort of standard set since uh, since the Columbine shooting and there have been principles and ways you're supposed to approach this thing and the main thing is obviously confronting the gunman as quickly as possible. So this is going to look at all the evidence that DOJ has gathered and give a report on what exactly went wrong um, and what lessons can be learned here uh, so that this, so that other law enforcement agencies uh, can take a different approach in the future. So Ryan, ahead of the report's release, we saw Attorney General Merrick Garland arriving in Uvalde yesterday. What should we know about his visit? Yeah, so I think that the Attorney General, obviously, this is a very important uh, investigation for him. Also, we saw Vanita Gupta is in town. She's the number three official uh, at the Justice Department. And this is sort of one of the last things she'll be doing because she's actually planning on leaving the Justice Department, uh, but has sort of taken charge uh, and overseeing this investigation. She had but also been in charge of the Ferguson investigation uh, way back. So the sort of it's a sort of the same type of uh, probe where they're hoping that these other uh, agencies can can really look 
into this and that this will have a broader impact uh, beyond just this one community and will uh, get, end up helping other law enforcement agencies be better prepared uh, for these sort of circumstances going forward. All right, Ryan Riley. Ryan, thank you so much. Now let's get to the bitter cold gripping the nation. So far this morning, tens of millions of Americans are again waking up under winter weather alerts. So far, more than 30 deaths have been linked to the frigid weather over the past week. An ice storm slammed parts of the Pacific Northwest, bringing freezing rain and snow, creating whiteout conditions and causing road closures. In the south, drivers in central Alabama actually abandoned their vehicles to avoid icy conditions on the roads. A few hours away, Nashville, Tennessee, saw more than six inches of snow this week, recorded its coldest weather in three decades. And in the northeast, Hard hit Buffalo is preparing to deal with even more lake effect snow, and that's on top of the three plus feet that some areas have already seen. For more on these frigid temperatures, let's get a closer look at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We've got more of the same coming your way uh, in multiple spots across the country. The cold weather, the snow, the rain, the freezing rain, all on the table in some spots. Let's take a big picture look. You can notice we do have some snow across portions of the Great Lakes. That lake effect snow, it continues today. We're going to see more and more of that here as the days go on. And we've also got that next storm system impacting the west. A little bit of snow working through portions of the Rockies and eventually the central plains later today. When it comes to what we'll be dealing with, uh, we've got the winter storm or winter uh, weather alerts, I should say, up for 64 million people. They ex stretch from the west all the way to the east, and we'll likely see these become more expansive as the next couple of days go on. We've got a couple things going on. We've got one system that's going to spread some of that snow into the center of the country, and then we've got another system that's going to kind of develop this area of low pressure that brings the potential for some wintry kind of mix. So we've got the freezing rain, the ice, the snow all on the table for portions of the south. As we get into the later parts of today, that snow spreads into parts of the Midwest, and we see these two kind of systems combined and then lift all of that snow into the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, and the Great Lakes. That happens tomorrow. Early in the morning, I'd say in places like New York City, you'll see that commute be a little dicey. I think I-95 will be difficult to travel through the day tomorrow. So just plan a little extra time for yourself. And again, no surprise here, more of that lake effect snow happening. We don't have a whole lot of ice cover on the lakes. So this means that the lake effect snow machine, as we call it, continues. We also have the potential for some icy conditions out west. This is going to be really difficult for travel. Power outages will be likely. We saw a kind of round of this yesterday and there's more to come. When it is all said and done here as we get through Saturday, we'll see another couple of inches of snow for some of those major cities that were super excited to see their first inch of snow in a while. We'll get maybe one to three inches. We're expected in places like New York, Philadelphia. The higher amounts are going to be uh, uh, you know, in the higher elevations and along the lake. You can see places like, like Buffalo, Erie could all pick up a substantial amount of snow between now and then. So this will be um, another snowy couple of days for folks there. But I think, uh, you know, places like New York, another delightful kind of snowfall where it doesn't interrupt too much, but it does come during the morning commute tomorrow um, and last through the afternoon commute. We, we like a, a delightful snowfall. Yeah. <laughs> we had this drought and now I just feel like it's snowing here. Listen, if you if it has to snow, you might as well be happy about it. Exactly. Whether yeah. you're happy or not, it's still going to snow. <laughs> right. That's a good point. I yeah. like that attitude. You should, respect you should have a I'm book of like, positive outlooks like that about yeah. the weather. <laughs> yeah. Putting on my 2024 plans. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Thanks Angie. Angie. <laughs> Writer E. Jean Carroll is set to continue being cross-examined this morning in her defamation trial against former President Trump. It was an eventful day in court yesterday. Carroll took the stand saying her life was upended after the former president accused her of making up allegations that he sexually assaulted her at a Manhattan department store in the 90s. Trump has already been found liable for sexual abuse and defamation. He's appealing that verdict and has denied ever meeting Carol. During court yesterday, the judge issued a warning to Trump about his disruptive behavior during Carol's testimony. This all comes as the former president has eyes on New Hampshire after a big win in Iowa earlier this week. NBC's Garrett Haig has the details. The campaign sprint to the New Hampshire primary taking a detour through a New York City courtroom. 
Donald Trump there for a second defamation lawsuit by writer E. Jean Carroll. The judge threatening to kick out the Republican frontrunner for talking too loudly to his attorney. Trump saying, I would love it. The judge replying, I know you would because you just can't control yourself in this circumstance. On social media, Trump attacking the judge as, quote, a seething and hostile Clinton appointed judge who is abusive, rude, and obviously not impartial. I'm leaving right now for New Hampshire. We just got a poll in that uh, shows me leading by a lot. And I think we'll do there, maybe similar to what we did in Iowa. It comes after Trump's rally in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley is a disaster. Looking for another landslide win and going after Nikki Haley. A new poll shows Haley in a distant second here, trailing Trump by 16 points. She's not tough enough to deal with these people. I will tell you that. She's not tough enough. Your time is Tuesday. The Granite State widely seen as make or break for Haley, with its mix of more independent voters and moderate Republicans like Haley supporter Jude Blake. Well, I think Trump doesn't believe in my version of democracy, and I'm just looking for an alternative, plus younger. We need yeah. younger, and we need women. Haley campaigning. I voted for President Trump twice, but rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. I'm the only one that's not running a basement campaign. While Ron DeSantis calling out both Trump and Haley for refusing to debate before the primary here. Donald Trump won't debate. He's not willing to, 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 to defend him his record. And Nikki Haley won't debate uh, because she's not willing to defend her record. What does that say? But that's not swaying Trump supporter Bob Swan. What put Trump over the top after you've looked at everybody else? Uh, the previous administration and uh, just the fact that he has an actual record forceful and willing to fight against the establishment. The former president will be off the campaign trail on Thursday to attend his mother in law's funeral in Florida. But the campaign is planning a series of large rallies this weekend, hoping to send a signal that this race is over if he can score another big win on Tuesday night. All right, Garrett, thank you. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now for more on the defamation case against Trump. Danny, good to see you. So Trump himself not expected to be in court today. So what are you going to be looking out for? And, and as this sort of starts to come to a close, what are you thinking about that you've seen so far? Yeah, this is a defamation case where only damages are at issue. So what we won't really see evidence of is whether or not what Trump said about Eugene Carroll was true or false, whether or not, as Trump has said, I never met the woman. None of that should come in, although Donald Trump, you never know, may blurt it out and then technically it's on the record. But we're going to continue to see the plaintiff build their damages case. We are going to see E. Jean Carroll subjected to cross-examination by Alina Haba. And she's given us a preview of her theory of cross-examination. It won't be so much just to minimize the damages that Carroll suffered, but instead she plans to go on the offensive, I believe. And it's going to be more along the lines of, wasn't, the, the, wasn't this conduct by Trump something that made you more famous than you ever could have imagined? Haven't you benefited from this conduct by Donald Trump. And that would go to her damages. It's a fair area for cross-examination. But I, I expect E. Jean Carroll is going to be pretty well prepared for that and explain and deny that and say, look, no, it's really what I said yesterday, which is this devastated me and it ruined my life. So is it still possible that Trump's team could call him to take the stand? And if that happened, could parameters be put in place for him testifying? The first question, yes, it is possible that they could call him. But... The plaintiff has, and I think correctly, uh, put in writing to the judge that, hey, you know, this is something that should be very severely limited because there's very little evidence that Donald Trump could offer since liability is already established. Now, the defense team, Alina Haba, has argued in opposition that, well, no, not so fast. When it comes to punitive damages, what is relevant is the defendants, and these are the magic words, uh, evil will, spite, hatred, things like that will tend to uh, build a punitive damages case. And those are damages that really aren't connected to the suffering of the plaintiff. They're connected to the punishment of the defendant and a warning to all other would-be defendants who might do the same thing. So we may see Donald Trump testify, although if I were betting, I would say the odds are unlikely, especially once he, uh, Donald Trump hears all the rules. Or he might try another move like he did in New York State Civil Court where He's told the rules, uh, the rules are clear, and he defies them anyway because mm -hmm. he's Trump. I want to ask you about a couple more details here before we let you go. So in addition to Trump being disruptive in court yesterday, as we discussed, his lawyers also called on the judge, Judge Kaplan, to recuse himself 
also motion for a mistrial. This is after Carol admitted to deleting threatening messages. Now, the judge ha had denied the, both of those requests, but what happened there? A lot of that's performative. The judge is not going to uh, declare a mistrial for something like that. I mean, it's possible and maybe on appeal you have a shot and you're making a record. You know, for defense attorneys and really for litigants always, the key is you really want to try and make a record because even if this judge isn't on board with you, for example, a motion to recuse is basically saying, hey, judge, I don't think you're an appropriate judge. So those motions, number one, are rarely granted. But number two, you've got to have some real chutzpah to bring a motion to recuse because you're going to, if that judge wasn't against you before, the judge is not going to be your fan for the rest of that trial. For Trump's defense team, they're not looking to make friends. They've made that clear. So they have no problem making a motion like that. And maybe on appeal, it would have a shot. But really, in reality, it may have been more performative than anything else. Mm. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you very much. President Biden hosted congressional leaders at the White House yesterday, hoping to broker a bipartisan immigration deal that would also provide critical military aid for Ukraine. It was the first face-to-face -face meeting between the president and Republican Speaker of the House Mike Johnson since Johnson won the gavel in October. Republicans are stressing the need for significant changes to border policy in return. Both sides called the talks productive, but it comes as lawmakers are also facing an imminent Friday night deadline to pass a temporary spending bill in order to keep the government funded. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba and NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin join us now. Good morning to both of you. So Monica, let's start with you. Are we any closer to a deal getting a temporary funding bill approved to avoid the government shutdown? It looks like it, Joe. Of course, these are things that actually have to take place in this critical time frame before we can say for sure. But the procedural steps that have to take place are already in motion, and there will be a critical vote today on the Senate floor to likely extend this to avoid a partial shutdown and really punt this into early March to deal with some of these other appropriation bills. So if that happens, of course, if it passes the Senate, then it has to go to the House in order to do that. But there was some cautious optimism that that can happen. And that was something that, of course, is happening in the context of this major meeting yesterday. But the real focus of it is this national security supplemental that deals with aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, while also providing some border funding. And that is happening on a separate track. And we just don't really have an exact timeline of when that could pass. But the urgency and the point of this meeting from the White House perspective was to stress to these congressional leaders that if there isn't this action, then Ukraine really could lose its war against Russia here. And they gave a detailed assessment of how that could happen in the coming weeks if Congress fails to act. Yeah, so Julie, walk us through where we're at. Where do things stand after this meeting? I mean, is there reason for optimism? I mentioned that we heard each side say that this was productive. What do we know about that? Yeah, you heard Monica say the real crux of this meeting was to talk about that border and Ukraine deal. And totally, from Johnson's perspective, he stressed to President Biden that they do need meaningful policy changes at the border. And you heard him and Leader Schumer, Leader McConnell, all the congressional leaders as well come out and say that there was broad consensus not only to address the crisis at the border, but also to send that crucial military aid overseas to Ukraine. Take a listen to what we heard from Johnson and Schumer. We'll talk about it on the other side. We must insist that the border be the top priority. I, I think we have some consensus around that table. Everyone understands the urgency of that, and we're going to continue to press for it. There was a large amount of agreement around the table that we must do Ukraine and we must do border. There was tremendous focus on Ukraine and an understanding that if we don't come to Ukraine's aid, that the consequences for America around the globe would be nothing short of devastating. Remember, this package that the Senate leaders are talking about is one in which the trio of Senate negotiators have been hammering out, trying to come to consensus for weeks now. They're still hung up on some major issues concerning the area of parole and the president's authority there. But there is some progress, as the leaders have signaled. Both McConnell and Schumer hope to move on that bill as soon as next week, they said. We'll see if they can get there, and then we'll see if Johnson in the House is going to put it on the floor without any changes that conservatives want. So, Monica, you've got Republican lawmakers demanding substantive policy change. When it comes to the border, President Biden's repeatedly said he is willing to compromise on certain measures. What could that compromise look like? 
And I'm told this is something he repeated yesterday in the room. He said and acknowledged that he believes the current immigration system is, in his words, broken and needs to be fixed. So this is something where he has said he would make significant compromise in the areas of how people seek asylum in this country and at the southern border. So that is a huge area where there could be shifts, and we just don't know exactly where, but we do expect there to be a change. And then also that question about how people, in terms of parole, Role and future parolees, how that works currently, and whether that could be changed in the future as well. That is a major open question. And then there have also been these larger conversations just about whether there needs to be more personnel, how this needs to operate, whether the time that people, while they're waiting for their asylum hearings, needs to be shortened, where they're going to wait for that. Are they going to be waiting in Mexico as opposed to in the United States, which of course the U.S. then needs to rely on the cooperation of Mexico. And today, uh, high-level Mexican delegation is actually coming to the U.S., to Washington, D.C., to meet with some key leaders in the cabinet to discuss that from a diplomatic aspect. And that is something that the president has said, look, I'm trying to do this on all fronts. He knows he needs to address it. He knows it's a major issue ahead of the 2024 election. All right, Monica, Julie, thank you both. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Yes, do. Well, let's turn to the Middle East now. The U.S. has carried out its fourth round of strikes on Houthi rebels in Yemen. The Pentagon confirmed the operation last night, saying it targeted 14 missile sites that it says were loaded and could have been fired on U.S. Navy ships and cargo vessels in the Red Sea. Earlier, U.S. Central Command said a Houthi drone hit a U.S.-owned vessel, causing damage but no injuries. The strikes come as the U.S. has taken the step of relisting the Houthis as a terrorist organization. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said the U.S. would reevaluate that designation if they cease their attacks. The Houthis say the decision will not impact their operations, which they say are in support of the Palestinians and target Israeli ships or vessels headed toward Israel. Staying with the war in Gaza, more than 100 hostages, including six Americans, are still being held hostage by Hamas. Among them is a father whose wife recently gave birth to a baby girl. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez sat down with the child's grandfather. Her name is Shahar, Hebrew for dawn. She was born five weeks ago with curious eyes and two big sisters who love her. But she's missing someone. Her father, Sagi Dekelhen, is one of six American hostages still held in Gaza. When Hamas overran kibbutz near Oz on October 7th, Sagi secured his family in a safe room, then went out to confront the terrorists. It was the last time they saw him. When he was taken captive, his wife Avital was seven months pregnant. Sagi missed his daughter's birth. He's never held his little girl and doesn't know his family survived the attack. Now his own father, Jonathan, stepping in until his son returns. If you could speak to him, what would you tell him about his new daughter? I would say that um, she is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and that his four girls, his wife and three daughters, are waiting for him to come home. His girls miss him terribly, and they have all kinds of questions that we cannot answer. When they ask you, where's dad, what do you tell them? The six-year-old is perfectly aware that some of her friends were murdered on October 7th. There's no point in trying to hide it three months later. And so she is aware that her dad is in Gaza. Hostages released in late November told Sagi's family they saw him in Hamas's tunnels, proof he was alive as recently as Thanksgiving. We received that news overjoyed, but ever since that day, of course, worry only increases. Jonathan's mission has taken him to a White House meeting with President Biden, but back in Israel, frustration growing with the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu. All of the other hostage families are doing what we must to keep the Israeli decision makers aware of their obligation to bring the hostages home alive. Tonight, a small glimmer of hope, a deal to get medicine to the hostages after more than 100 days. In exchange, Israel allowing more medical aid for Palestinian civilians in Gaza, where the health care system has all but collapsed. At least a third of the hostages have chronic conditions, families say, and they're demanding proof the medication reached their loved ones. We must get clear proof that each and every hostage got 
the needed medications. For Sigi's family and so many others, fear of more milestones missed. He's already missed his daughter's birth. Do you worry what else he's going to miss as his captivity continues? Part of me, yes, but I can't think in those terms because that would bring on hopelessness and he doesn't deserve our hopelessness. <laughs> so I'm driven by the desire to make sure that they all come home tomorrow and they won't have to miss anything else. Our thanks to Raf for that report. Here in America, families of U.S. and Israeli hostages are expected to meet with the National Security Advisor at the White House today, hoping to keep the spotlight on their plight. Well, there's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Up next, Boeing facing more fallout over this mid-air emergency as the first round of inspections wraps up. We'll have the latest on the investigation. Up first after the break, royal concerns over the health of King Charles and Princess Kate. What we know about their conditions next on Morning News Now. We are back with the latest on the health of the British royals. This morning, the Princess of Wales, that's Kate Middleton, she's recovering from what Kensington Palace says was successful abdominal surgery. In a statement, the palace said, quote, it is expected that she will remain in hospital for 10 to 14 days before returning home to continue her recovery. Based on the current medical advice, she is unlikely to return to public duties until after Easter. The news of her surgery came less than an hour before another health update, this time her father-in-law, the king, King Charles. Buckingham Palace says that he will have a corrective procedure done next week to treat an enlarged prostate. Joining us now for more on this is NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, great to have you with us. Thank you. Let's start on Kate. So Kensington Palace, they didn't expand on the reasons for an abdominal surgery with uh, quite a long hospital stay, quite a long recovery time. What could this be? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, what are the options about what you need abdominal surgery with those types of parameters? Right, well, so you can imagine because of, of their desire to be very private about this, they've released very, very little medical information. There's been wide speculation um, amongst the public and amongst medical experts about what possibly this abdominal surgery could have entailed that would require such a lengthy recovery. Typically for abdominal surgeries these days, people are in the hospital for one to two to three days, maybe at most. Wow. Um, you know, we know that her only major medical condition that she's, um, you know, divulged to the public is this condition, hyperemesis gravidarum, that severe mm -hmm. condition of pregnancy pregnancy, which in certain cases can lead to some complications that does that do involve the GI tract, specifically the esophagus. Mm. This is absolutely pure speculation. I have absolutely mm. no idea if this is the nature of her surgery. Um, you know, we don't know. And, and I'm hoping that if there is a, um, um, this was truly a medical procedure, that she might maybe, you know, let the public know, because I think it would be very informative, um, especially for a lot of women out there who might have had complications from, from her condition, perhaps in the past. The oh. fact that it's two weeks in the hospital, mm -hmm. two months till she would resume yeah. royal duties, what does that tell us about how severe this could be? Right. Is that surprising? It would indicate that it was probably a procedure that involved her, uh, you know, maybe esophagus or intestines. Those are the kinds of the procedures that typically would take longer to recover that maybe would require a lengthier stay in the hospital, perhaps for hydration or mm. feeding or to make sure that there were no complications and that the recovery could therefore be lengthier. You know, something like a hysterectomy, something like getting your gallbladder. I mean, those those are, you're in one day for those procedures. Okay. So, wow. you know, it would indicate to someone um, that the procedure was more involved, involving her, you know, GI, intestinal, internal organs, but without specifics, it's really difficult to tell you exactly what happened. I can't believe for a hysterectomy, it's only a day turnaround. That's I mean, people, I mean, it's, it's quick. Wow. It's quick. Uh, let's switch over to King Charles mm -hmm. now. So tell us what we should, I mean, think, putting his age in context, yeah. what he has shared. By the way, I mean, right. pretty cool, I guess, that he's sharing this, and kind of uh, shedding light on this. I know. And, and it's interesting because I think this is following sort of in, in his desire to be a more modern you yeah, know, monarchy right. and, and being more open. This, does, there's no secret about this. He has a, an enlarged prostate. This is incredibly common 
in men, especially as men get older. The procedure, the most common procedure to, to surgically correct an enlarged prostate is something called a transurethral resection of the prostate or a TERP. Okay. It's non-invasive. It's very effective. Um, he will probably be in the hospital for a couple of days. Usually what, what is required is a urinary catheter afterwards. Um, but people recover fully um, and, and he should do great. It has nothing to do with prostate cancer. Mm. Um, but it is, I think, nice that he's bringing awareness to this uh, mm -hmm. and is not embarrassed about it. We know right. we often get embarrassed when we talk about anything that has to do with our genitourinary systems. But we all have them um, in this so, area, so, in this so area, is. from here to here. Yeah. Um, so it's nice that he has shared this. He should do quite well. Yeah, yeah. that's very cool, Dr. Azar. Always great to see you. Thank you. I know you we don't know a lot, but you helped us understand. So what far, not, not much. <laughs> More international headlines in Ecuador. A prosecutor investigating last week's attack at a TV station has been killed. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has that and other news for us from around the world. Hey, Claudio. Good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. That's right. The name of the prosecutor was Cesar Suarez and he was murdered in the city of Guayaquil, which is also known for its violence. Now, at the time of his death, Suarez was reportedly leading an investigation into an on-air attack that happened at a local TV station just last week. Suarez was also known for carrying out high-profile investigations. The prosecutor was reportedly driving to a court hearing when he was shot in broad daylight. Ecuador has been rocked by surges in violent attacks, including the recent abductions of several police officers. Both the Attorney General and the Council of the Judiciary condemned Suarez's attack, but they have not confirmed who is responsible for the murder. Now let's travel to Tunisia, where protesters are erupting in a local town after dozens of migrants and asylum seekers went missing. About 37 migrants boarded a boat on January 11th. Relatives say they received phone calls from loved ones as the boat set out to sea at around 2.30 p.m. But by 10 p.m. the same night, all contact was lost. Many of those family members say they have received little or no news about their lost loved ones. Most of the passengers are from the small village of El Hancha, ranging from about 13 to 35 year old. We end our travels with a big moment in history. Japan Airlines just named their first woman president. Mitsuko Totori actually started off as a flight attendant. She is the first woman to climb the ladder from that position to the company's new head. At a press conference Wednesday, Totori vowed to stick to her commitment to flight safety. She will take office starting in April. Back to you guys. That is very cool. Good for her. All right, Claudia, thanks so much. Coming up, crisis and controversy at the southern border. Texas taking on the feds over how to handle millions of migrants attempting to get into the U.S. The state's response to Homeland Security's latest request. Plus, renewed concerns about the safety of Boeing's planes after that in-flight emergency. Why investigators are now turning their attention toward a subcontractor for the company. That's next on Morning News Now. We're back now with the ongoing crisis at the southern border and the continuing legal fight between the Biden administration and the state of Texas. In a letter to the Department of Homeland Security, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton rejected the White House's request for the state to stop its takeover of Shelby Park. The area is the epicenter of border crossings in Eagle Pass, Texas, on the Rio Grande River. The Biden administration says actions taken by the state have blocked U.S. Border Patrol agents from accessing the area. For the latest developments, let's bring in NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. Julia, good morning to you. So let's begin with the Texas Attorney General, his response to that cease and desist letter from the White House. We know last weekend a woman and two children drowned in the Rio Grande after Border Patrol agents say they were barred from entering the area. So what is the AG Ken Paxton now saying in response to that letter? Well, Paxton is known for being very blunt and uh, really liking to stick it to Democrats and definitely to this administration. And in this letter, he pulled no punches. He was very uh, direct in saying that the reason why, I'm sorry about my dog, uh, the reason why they would have to, uh, the reason why Texas can take over this park is because Border Patrol is not doing its job of, t of watching the border, that they only have access when it comes to implementing immigration policy and that they have 
haven't been doing their job when they try to come and rescue migrants. Now, one of the things that they had to get rid of last week when they kicked Border Patrol out of this park in Texas was surveillance equipment. And Border Patrol says that if they had that surveillance equipment in place, these watchtowers and these cameras, they would have seen those migrants in distress and they would have been able to get to them. But Texas is saying that's not part of their mission and that they should leave that area. This could end up being a lawsuit. And if it is, that would be the third from this administration and the fourth uh, over Texas's border policies. What should we know about the Biden administration and the actions they could potentially take if Texas refuses to comply with this request? Well, before they, when they wrote this request, they said that if Texas did not cease and desist by the end of the day yesterday, they would go to the Justice Department. Now, at this point, the Justice Department has no comment on what they might do, but you can read between the lines there. What they want is the Justice Department to bring a lawsuit. DHS wouldn't bring that lawsuit. The Justice Department would bring it on behalf of DHS, saying that Texas is impeding on Border Patrol's right to get into these areas, do the processing that they need to do, do humanitarian rescues if needed, and to try to you know, do their job on the southern border. That's how they would get the Justice Department involved. But just based on what you've seen in the past, usually you get a Western District of Texas judge that agrees with the Biden administration. It goes up to appeals. They kick it back to Texas's side, and then it lands in the hands of the Supreme Court, and we're left waiting for a long time. Julia, real quick, if your dog will allow, a federal <laughs> appeals court on Wednesday uh, reversed an order requiring Texas to move a floating barrier on the Rio Grande, which was aimed at preventing crossings. What should we know about this decision by the court? Yeah, she's 13 pounds, but she's a lot of noise. So I will say, uh, with that decision, with the razor wire, this is something that could go back and forth. Now what the Biden administration is telling the Supreme Court is that they're, they've been forced to remove this wire and that it is actually impeding their ability to get to certain parts of the border. They can't do their work because the agents themselves can't get through the razor wire. And they submitted a supplemental memo that showed pictures of that. So they're trying to show the Supreme Supreme Court what a problem this is. But the Supreme Court still won't weigh in until the Fifth Circuit actually weighs in on the merits of this case. At least that's what it looks like now. But it's really shocking if you think about it how long all of this is playing out and what Texas is doing. This is unprecedented for a state mm. to come in and tell an executive, a you know, federal level law enforcement agency that they don't have the right to do what they've been doing for decades. And in this case, that's to police the southern border, to take over a place where we've seen border agents stay and process hundreds and thousands of migrants and say, now you can't come in. We're really in uncharted territory. And the fact that this could drag on for months is, is something we've, we've never encountered. All right, Julia Ainsley. Julia, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, nearly two weeks after that mid-air emergency involving a Boeing 737 MAX 9 used by Alaska Airlines, the FAA says they are widening their probe into the aircraft maker. The agency says they're now looking deeper into Spirit Aerosystems. That's a company that makes and installs the door plugs, a word we've all become familiar with, for Boeing 737 MAX 9 airplanes. NBC News senior aviation correspondent Tom Costello has more. With the MAX 9 fleet grounded, forcing United and Alaska Airlines to cancel hundreds of flights each day, the FAA said today it's now reviewing data from the first 40 MAX 9 inspections before inspecting the rest of the grounded fleet. Underscoring the loss of airline trust in Boeing, Alaska Airlines is now sending its own inspectors to Boeing plants. Adding more experienced professionals to the teams that validate work and quality on the production line for the 737. The production line is where Boeing's reputation is on the line. Five years after two fatal MAX 8 crashes overseas, the MAX 9 fuselage is made by Spirit Aerosystems, which has struggled with quality control for years. The FAA is now investigating both Boeing and Spirit production practices. Boeing CEO David Calhoun told Spirit employees today, we're going to learn from it and then we're going to apply it to literally everything else we do. As the NTSB lab in Washington analyzes the critical evidence, the door plug that exploded was supposed to cover an unused emergency exit secured with four bolts. The NTSB says it was made at a spirit plant in Malaysia. The question is whether bolts were ever attached. 
Alaska and United Airlines say they've since found loose bolts on other grounded MAX 9s. Boeing, meanwhile, has also hired an outside audit team led by a retired Navy admiral to review Boeing's quality control program. Still no word on when the MAX 9 might return to service. Back to you. All right, Tom Costello, thank you. Coming up, overdraft fees under scrutiny. When we come back, the new plan by the Biden administration to fight back against big banks and what it could mean for your wallet. Also, it's rough out there in this winter weather, not just for us humans. We're going to get some tips on how to keep your four-legged friends, including Julia Ainsley's, <laughs> and freeze, keep them warm in freezing temps. So don't pause your devices. Morning News Now will be right back. Welcome back. Well, it's happened to almost everyone at one time or another. You miscalculate how much you think is in your checking account, overdraw it, then you get hit with an overdraft fee. Well, over time, those fees can add up. Just how much? According to data from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, over the last 23 years, look at this number on your screen. Americans paid an estimated $280 billion in overdraft fees. That's a lot of money. Well, that could all soon change. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau just unveiled a new proposal targeting big banks' overdraft fee practices, hoping to help consumers. Caleb Silver, Editor-in-Chief at Investopedia, joins us now for more. Caleb, always great to have you. So tell us what we should know about these proposed changes and what it just means for anybody watching at home. Yeah, these are what they call junk fees. President Biden hates these fees. He's been on a mission to eliminate these. So what they're proposing, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, are two options for banks. None of them the banks like very much at all. One of them is to make these overdraft loans actually loans, turn them into for-profit credit line loans instead of this fee you're going to get every time you uh, exceed your balance. That would be paid by the borrower over time based on their credit. So that's one of the proposals. The other one is to offer overdraft protection as a courtesy instead of just unrolling you into it. The, the uh, Consumer Bankers Association, the big lobby for banks, doesn't like either of these proposals. This is going to go through a long, long year of negotiation before anything happens. So overdraft fees have been around for so long. Why are we seeing this push now? Yeah. Yeah, President Biden has been trying to crack down on these fees and other fees charged by credit card companies because they're owners and they hurt lower income people the most. The, the overdraft is usually for about 26 bucks. That's the average and it's usually repaid within three days. So to get a $30, $35 fee if you've overdrafted $26 seems blatantly unfair, especially for lower income folks that are just trying to get by. So you kind of touched on this, but like, is this a done deal? Are we going to see the banks push back on this? And if they don't, or if they do, when might people stop getting those fees? Oh, they're pushing back. They don't like this one bit. So this is going to be in negotiation for the better part of this year. If it goes into effect, one or both of these proposals, you'll see it by October 2025. But the idea is to bring the overdraft fees down from about 30 bucks to somewhere between $3 and $14, depending on the borrower. Not a done deal by any measure. A proposal right now, a lot of negotiation is going to go on this year. Mm. So in the meantime, you have a long time yeah. to you still worry about the overdraft. Don't overdraft, <laughs> yes. And there's nothing more infuriating than opening your balance or getting yeah. that note oh. from the bank saying you overdrafted yeah. when you thought you were in line, but things happen. Yep. All right, Caleb Silver, thank you so much. Let's stick with money news. We've got quite the update on that Apple Watch court battle. Yeah, we do. CNBC Silvana Hanau has the latest there and some other money headlines for us. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. All right, let's get you some headlines. Apple will start selling versions of the Series 9 and Ultra 2 watches without a blood oxygen feature that's following a setback in a patent dispute with medical device maker Massimo. Apple says the tweak models will go on sale at its retail stores and online starting today. They will still include the blood oxygen monitor, but it won't work. A federal appeals court declining to extend a pause on a ban on sales of the watches in the U.S. even while the appeals process plays out. Apple believes that could last at least a year. The watch business generated 10% of Apple's revenue last year. Apple's Vision Pro headset won't have a dedicated Netflix app when it goes on sale. Pre-orders for the mixed reality device start tomorrow. Bloomberg reports Netflix also doesn't want to make its iPad app compatible with the Vision Pro. This means users will have to log in on the web to watch Netflix content with the headset, which start at $3,499. Other streaming services have announced support for the Vision Pro, including Disney+, Amazon Prime Video, and Paramount+. 
And Condé Nast is folding Pitchfork. The music site it bought in 2015 with men's magazine GQ. The move resulting in layoffs at Pitchfork, including its editor-in-chief. Pitchfork, which was founded by an indie music fan in 1996, cultivated a brand around music criticism. The site has struggled in recent years to expand its audience with the rise of social media platforms and apps like Spotify and TikTok, guys. Hmm. Maybe we didn't need something focused on criticism anyway. Let's yeah. be positive. Yeah, no, their music exactly. criticism has a place. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'm a little negative. Right. Savannah, so, thank you so much. Sure thing. We know the extreme weather that we've been experiencing lately has humans bundling up and finding ways to stay warm, but the chilly conditions can also impact our pets. According to the D.C.-based nonprofit, American Humane Pet Owners need to take extra precautions to keep their animals safe during these conditions. They say pets left to fend for themselves in cold weather are susceptible to injury or even death. So today, we're offering some tips to keep your furry friends safe in these freezing temperatures. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Ruth McPeach. She is a veterinarian and the author of Lizette the Vet. <laughs> Doctor, good to have you with us. I want to read this book now, by the way. So <laughs> first of all, if you're doing your daily walks with your pets, I think one question people have is, is there a temperature when that becomes just too dangerous? That's a great question. Unfortunately, there isn't one number I can give you. It really depends on your particular pet. So just like us, pets feel cold. And how cold, again, depends on the pet. It depends on things like your pet's breed, their age, their weight, and their overall health. We know that certain dogs like huskies have a thick coat and a double-layered double coat. So that keeps them warm and they tend to be more acclimated to the cold. But other dogs like my dog, like Dobermans and Chihuahuas have very thin coats and they're gonna be more susceptible to the cold than, uh, than other animals with thicker coats. Doctor, who else is joining us? Who is this? <laughs> This is Jet, and you can see he's all bundled up <laughs> for the cold weather. Yeah, we're going to ask you about that in just a minute about like some tips, like if that helps. I'm so curious. I have a dog, by the way. Her name's Lucy, and Lucy has lots of outfits that she's fine with me putting her in, which oh. really makes me kind of proud of her. You know, I'm like, oh, we both like her clothes. Um, doctor, though, tell us, because even if you're not going to take your dog on a walk, I mean, you got to take your dog out, right? What should you look out for when you're even doing just a quick trip outside? Well, like you mentioned, you want to really just adjust your schedule. So they do need to go outside, but what you're going to want to do is adjust your walks and outside playtime according to the weather. So if they have to go out, I do recommend bundling them up. Um, I do think that putting jackets on them and booties or sweaters is a great idea. Not only does it help keep them warm, but as you mentioned, they look cute and fashionable as well. Um, my dog likes it and gets extra attention. But again, the goal <laughs> is really to keep them warm when they're outside. When Lucy wears a vest out, I am like, oh, please. I know she's famous. <laughs> People laugh, love to talk about it. <laughs> are, are, are there any other tips or things you hear or see people do that you just no, no, don't, don't do that. Well, I do think it's really important that people are mindful of the fact that in winter, there are a lot of different chemicals out there on the ground. Mm. So there are de-icers and salt on the ground, and all those things can irritate your pet's paws. Um, in addition to the fact that your pets often lick their feet and their paws, and so they can ingest those chemicals. So I'm a big fan of booties if your pet will wear them. I think those are great. It keeps the chemicals outside and protects your pet. If you, your pet won't wear booties or that doesn't work for you, then I recommend wiping your pet's paws when they come inside. Just give them a quick wipe down. Um, you can even use, you know, a pet wipe or you can use a paper towel with water. Just wipe off the chemicals to get those off their feet. All right. Very good. You, by the way, we're looking at all dogs from our staff. Yes, here those models are part now. of the team. Very good models. Does Lucy yeah. wear booties? She, booties, I haven't tried. I mean, that I don't think she'd do. She's no. kind of okay. like, eh. <laughs> But she very easily lets me put a sweater or a vest on, which well, I love. I'm go. happy to hear it, it does something, because I'm always kind of like, is this, they have a coat <laughs> them, that they always Fashion wear. Fashion and function. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Dr. Ruth McPete, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We and really thank appreciate you, Jet. it. Thank you. Bye, Jet. <laughs> Coming up, changing the narrative. Up next, how an artist from a Chicago neighborhood known for shootings and violence is using his talent to turn his community around. This is Morning News Now. 
Let's end this hour with a look at one man's efforts to turn tragedy into an opportunity to reshape the narrative around Chicago's Roseland community. Yet through a series of portraits, a local artist is helping shift the perspective of the neighborhood, known for shootings and violence by highlighting the memory of its community members. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has that story. In a church in Chicago's Roseland neighborhood on the city's south side, there is a celebration yeah, this is nice. of the people who call this place home. Long known for shootings and violence, Roseland is now reframing its own narrative. It began with Andre Taylor. Dre was a wonderful grandchild, great grandson. The 16-year-old star athlete was killed in 2016. Police telling his great-grandmother, Betty Johnson, the shooter thought he was someone else. To go out there and look at him laying there on the ground, bleeding in the rain, it's a feeling that you never, ever will forget. I just remember seeing young people walking around in a little bit of a daze. In a place used to memorials, the pastor thought this one needed to be different. It needed to honor the neighborhood that loved Dre. What better way to show the beauty of the neighborhood than to show people's faces? Enter local artist John Baker. People submitted their own photos. Yeah, it's important that people control how they get represented. For the next five years, Baker painted members of the community, nurses and cops, musicians and kids, Betty and Dre. 500 years ago, the only people who got their portraits painted were kings and each of us are worthy of that kind of attention. This is the Roseland Portrait Project, 397 faces later. When I go out there and look at all of them, they see my grandson. See that? Does my heart really good. Roseland, the whole picture. Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Chicago. And that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, that deadly Arctic blast not letting up today. It's not just the bitter cold freezing out much of the country. Snowstorms are once again blanketing millions across the Rockies and the Great Lakes, with the Northeast next in line for another run-in with the white stuff. It's all taking a brutal toll on travel nationwide. We've got your full forecast in just a moment. More chaos in a New York courtroom Wednesday. Former President Trump and a federal judge clashing over his conduct in that highly publicized defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Kerr. We've got much more on what went down as the former president ramps up his attacks on former Ambassador Nikki Haley ahead of next week's New Hampshire primaries. We're also on Royals Watch this morning. The health of both Princess Kate and King Charles himself now in the global spotlight. Their conditions, plus the questions now swirling around why the palace is being so open with these revelations. And later in the hour, you could call it a sign of the times. All those quirky, clever, sometimes even downright funny electronic highway messages will soon be in our rear view mirror. Read that one for us. I can't. I literally will. You'll hear later. I'm not even going to try a Boston accent because I just sound like someone on the Upper East Side trying to do a Boston accent. It doesn't it doesn't work for me. You want to try it? No, it's your story. Use your blinka. All right. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll have some fun with that uh, and the signs coming up a little later. Let's begin, of course, with the winter weather. It is deadly winter weather impacting the nation. So far, there have been more more than 30 confirmed deaths related to the weather in just the past week. Yeah, and this is all while brutal conditions impact travel on the roads and in the air. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa is live in Buffalo with the latest for us. Hi, Emily, good morning. Good morning to you guys. Right now, the wind chill here is a bone chilling seven degrees, powering a relentless lake effect snow machine. You can see this area was just recently plowed, but as I walk over here, you can get a better sense for just how deep the snow is. This is an area that has seen snow the past 14 days in a row. There's so much snow on the ground. Officials say it's not just a matter of pushing it out of the way. They actually have to have trucks come in, pick it up and relocate the snow as communities across the country are dealing with this brutal winter weather punch.
This morning, another powerful and dangerous winter storm is on the move. Bitter cold from coast to coast. Oh, 66 million people are under winter weather alerts. Those brutal conditions impacting air travel nationwide, with more than 5,000 flight delays and 1,100 cancellations Wednesday. Every hour, they would just say, oh, delay, delay, delay. State police say five family members were struck and killed by a tractor trailer on a snowy Pennsylvania interstate after they left their vehicles following a separate crash. In hard hit Buffalo, even more lake effect snow is expected on top of the three plus feet that has buried the city in recent days. Driving conditions overnight, treacherous. With authorities warning, clearing this amount of snow can be dangerous. If you have a heart condition, uh, you should avoid snow shoveling and even snow blowing. In the West, the weather closing roads and sending drivers sliding. And with more than half of the country now covered in snow for the first time this winter, in Illinois, wind chills dipped as low as 40 below. Tow truck drivers like David Burtz wearing special gear to work in freezing conditions. Oh, definitely. Uh, with, with, with the actual temperatures, this prevent any frostbite on, on our face. And while snow plows are working around the clock here, officials are urging people when they head out on the roadways to use extreme caution because when we see these powerful wind gusts, sometimes 35 miles an hour come through here, those gusts pick up the snow and can create whiteout conditions. And this snow machine isn't letting up yet for parts of western New York. It could see another foot of snow on top of all the snow already or even a matter of feet after what has really been a wild week of weather. Joe and Savannah. Oh, all right, Emily, thanks for being out there for us. For more on how this bitter cold might be impacting your area, let's get a check on your Morning News Now weather forecast. Angie Lastman is here to tell us who's going to freeze. Angie, good morning. Everybody needs the layers, guys. Good morning to you. Bundling up is going to be uh, exactly what you'll have to do from here through really the end of the weekend uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of areas across the country. Here's what we're dealing with this morning. Seven million people under these freeze alerts. The South is not being excluded from this cold air. We've got 13 million people under these wind chill alerts, mainly centered across the the middle of the country, but we've got this reinforcing blast of cold air that we're going to see work in, and it really makes a difference with these temperatures. As we get into the afternoon hours today, just nine for the high in Minneapolis will feel like minus four, moving a little farther to the south, teens for Omaha, feeling like the single digits, and the 30s on tap for Wichita, but we will, of course, be feeling like the 20s. Looking ahead to tomorrow, it spreads a little farther to the south. Dallas ends up at 36, feeling like 27. Places like uh, Chicago will feel like five below. And we've got these bitter cold temperatures stretched across most of the plains out into the into portions of the Midwest and down towards the south. We only see minor improvements as the weekend gets uh, going here. Uh, we really have to wait until next week to see some significant improvements. And that significant improvement for Chicago is going to come from being at 15 degrees on Saturday to 34 degrees on Monday. So still feeling very much like winter as we roll into next week. But we'll at least leave behind the really bitter, bitter cold temperatures temperatures for now. Who knows what will happen after that. But hey, here's what we've got as far as the winter alert. 69 million people from the west to the east are included in this as we gear up for this next couple of, of storms that we'll have to deal with. The snow today is going to go from the Rockies into the Midwest, and we'll see some of that uh, difficult travel across that region. We're also going to see a new low develop across portions of the southeast and that's going to bring the rain, the snow, the ice. We'll see the freezing rain cause difficulty from really the Tennessee Valley to points south of that. That'll be something that causes uh, difficult travel, as I mentioned. But then as we get into tomorrow, the difficult travel will be along I-95. Specifically, we'll see the mid-Atlantic northeast picking up on some additional snowfall. It's going to be pretty similar to the snowfall accumulations that we saw with this previous storm. So one to three inches expected from New York to Washington, D.C. But notice what you see there. You see the lake effect snow not ending anytime soon. Folks downwind of the lakes are going to get another good batch of snow over the the next couple of days as we see these strong winds ramp up in the wake of that system as it moves out. So by the time we finish all of this up, likely through Saturday, guys, we could see another foot of snow along the lake. If you're wondering here, New York, Philadelphia, D.C., maybe closer to one to three inches. So not quite as much, but still, it'll look cool. I'll take it.
I love it. Thank you, Angie, for the snow and your report. <laughs> well, the race for the White House continues in New Hampshire this week, ahead of Tuesday's crucial primary for the Republican presidential hopefuls. The frontrunner for the nomination, former President Trump, is ramping up his attacks on rival Nikki Haley. But his attention has also been here in New York, as the defamation trial brought on by writer E. Jean Carroll continues today. NBC's Garrett Hake joins us again this morning from New Hampshire with the latest on this. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. We've been seeing something of a commuter campaign these last couple days with Donald Trump starting his day in court in New York City, ending it in New Hampshire with a rally. He's really been shifting his attention here to attacking Nikki Haley. She sits in second place and has an opportunity here, but she's really running out of time to close the gap. I'm thrilled to be back in the great state of New Hampshire. Overnight, well. Donald Trump escalating his attacks on Nikki Haley, hammering away at his closest competitor here ahead of New Hampshire's Tuesday primary. A vote for Nikki Haley this Tuesday is a vote for Joe Biden and a Democrat Congress this November. Because that's what Trying to drive a wedge between Haley and the state's Republican voters. The people behind Nikki Haley are pro-amnesty, they're pro-China, they're pro-open borders. You know, she wants open borders. Don't kid yourself. The broadsides from the former president coming as two new polls show Haley in a clear but distant second place here. Now, I know Trump threw a, a temper tantrum about me last night. The former South Carolina governor urging New Hampshire voters to tune out Trump's tirades and what she says are his lies about her record. Regardless of what Trump says, I passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country when I was governor. The field for the key primary narrowing with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis switching focus to the next state, South Carolina, Haley's home. After finishing a distant second place in Iowa, DeSantis trying to attack his rivals for refusing to debate. I think it's very telling that you have three basement campaigns, Biden, Haley and Trump. The campaign shakeups coming as Mr. Trump spent most of his day in court attending a second defamation case against him brought by writer E. Jean Carroll. The former president sparring with the judge, who threatened to have him removed from court for talking with his attorney too loudly during testimony, complaining afterwards. And he's a nasty judge. He's a Trump-hating guy. A separate jury found Mr. Trump liable for defaming and sexually abusing Carroll, which he has repeatedly denied. Another opportunity for Nikki Haley today. She'll essentially have the Granite State to herself with both Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump back home in Florida. Donald Trump off the trail entirely today to attend the funeral for his mother-in-law. Savannah. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you very much. Later today, the Justice Department is expected to release the findings of its nearly year-and-a-half-long investigation into the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas. The attack happened back in 2022 at Robb Elementary School, left 19 students and two teachers dead. NBC News Justice correspondent Ken Delanian is there with more. Ken, good morning. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. The families of the children who died inside Robb Elementary still have many questions about what happened that day including why it took authorities more than an hour to engage and kill the 18-year-old gunman. Some parents told me they believe this report is their best chance to get answers. This morning, a community still in search of truth and accountability. More than a year after a teenager with an assault-style rifle opened fire inside a Texas elementary school, taking the lives of 19 children and two adults. Later today, Attorney General Merrick Garland will deliver the results of an exhaustive Justice Department investigation into one of the nation's worst school shootings. A source briefed on the nearly 600-page report telling NBC News it includes disturbing new details. Among them, authorities relaying incorrect information to some parents in the aftermath of the shooting about whether their children had survived or been killed. According to the source, the report will also detail the failures of medical first responders, police, and government officials. All of it building on a scathing investigation by state lawmakers that found systemic failures and egregiously poor decision making among the nearly 400 law enforcement officers who responded. Police body cam footage from the shooting shows officers milling about in the hallways and mistaking a door where the killer was for being locked. We're having a problem getting in the more than an hour passing before officers confronted and stopped the shooter. During that time, children called 911, begging for help. 
One of those exchanges revealed in a frontline documentary on PBS. Please hurry. There's a lot of dead bodies. Jacob Alvarado, an off-duty Border Patrol agent, telling Savannah he rushed to the school where his daughter was a second grader, his wife a teacher, who texted him about the shooter. Both of them survived. I could just see kids coming out of the windows and kids coming, coming my way, so I was just helping all the kids out. Among those who didn't make it out, nine-year-old Jacqueline Cesaris, one of the youngest victims. You don't ever get, get over a loss like this, I mean. Never, especially this type of loss. It's, it's unbearable. You know, people tend to say, get over it, go on, how can you? That's your child. Investigators say responding officers also broke decades of active shooter protocol by failing to confront and stop the threat immediately. But only a handful of officers have been disciplined. The school behind me still stands, in part because it's needed for evidence in multiple lawsuits. Joe. All right. Kendall Linney and Ken, thank you so much. Well, this morning we're monitoring the health of two members of the British royal family. Kate, the Princess of Wales, is recovering in the hospital after abdominal surgery, while King Charles is expected to undergo a procedure next week for an enlarged prostate. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from outside Kensington Palace in London. Hey, Molly, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. A lot going on and two major royal health announcements in the same day is extremely rare. Looking at just Kate's condition, it sounds very serious. They say she'll be in the hospital for nearly two weeks out of view for another three months. And Kensington Palace isn't telling us why she initially needed that surgery. This morning for the second day in a row, Kate, the Princess of Wales, is recovering in the hospital after what Kensington Palace calls a successful planned abdominal surgery, saying she will likely remain in the hospital for 10 to 14 days, a rare lengthy stay. A source at Kensington Palace confirms her condition is non-cancerous. I wish Kate well. I think she's a fantastic princess. I wish her fast recovery. Uh, hopefully she's going to be okay. The palace also says she'll now cancel all events until after Easter, a long time to be out of view for the most popular royal. You know, I was told that she had a very packed schedule coming up between now and Easter and was very much looking forward to it. And that was just... Uh, a couple of weeks back, so things have obviously moved fairly quickly. Kate has long been seen as healthy, very sporty, oh! talking about the benefits of exercise. I really mm. generally love all sports. You know, I love swimming. Personally, I love swimming. Oh, cold swimming, love... the colder the better. Really? With no known health issues outside of the much publicized extreme morning sickness with all three pregnancies, hospitalized for one. And last week on her 42nd birthday, the royal family posted this behind the scenes snap from King Charles's coronation, no inkling that anything might be wrong. We last saw Kate celebrating Christmas with the whole family at Sandringham. And the statement adds she hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible. George, Charlotte, and of course, Little Louis are at the center of their lives, and Prince William will also postpone events to support his family. Also yesterday, in a stunning second royal health statement in one day, Buckingham Palace announced King Charles will have a corrective procedure next week for an enlarged prostate. His Majesty's condition is benign, the palace says, reassuring news for this 75-year-old monarch. Now, Kensington Palace has just confirmed to NBC News that Prince William visited his wife in the hospital this morning, and he won't be holding any engagements while she is still in the hospital. And certainly, Savannah, in the next couple of months, he'll be scaling back. They've also said there will be no international travel for either Kate or William in the next couple of months. Savannah? All right, Molly Hunter, thank you very much. Let's bring in NBC News Royal commentator Daisy McAndrew for more on this. Daisy, good to have you with us. So let's start with the Princess of Wales. What more are you learning about Kate's condition? because there's just so much we don't know right now. Well, as you said, you know, at the moment, the details of um, what exactly procedure Kate had are very uh, scant. There's, all, of course, a lot of speculation going on on this side of the pond. People saying that two weeks in hospital um, for such a young, fit woman is a long time, so this surgery must have been quite serious. There has also been, though, a lot of praise for the openness um, with which both Charles and his uh, prostate issues um, and Kate um, have revealed the details of their, their medical situation. 
because, in fact, it's very different over here. There is no constitutional obligation for senior royals to disclose uh, details about their medical situations, not like uh, your politicians and your presidents over there. So, actually, anything they do say, uh, they are giving up voluntarily, if you like. Also, just a word about um, Prince William. There has been quite a lot of um, acknowledgement that this is a very different type um, of uh, father, that he has said that he is giving up um, doing his sort of official duties over the next few weeks to be uh, at Kate's side, but particularly to be looking after the kids, carry on taking them on the school run and so on. That, of course, is a very different situation than his parents or his grandparents uh, would have taken. Mm. What's been the reaction in the UK? I mean, it's nice to hear that you say that people appreciate the openness uh, so far that we've heard. But now that we just know, you know, she's going to be in the hospital for two weeks, what are people there saying? I think there has been a lot of concern. If you look at the, the, the front pages of the newspapers uh, today, no great surprise that Kate is on the front and Charles of all those newspapers. But really, you know, some of the newspapers saying, you know, we are praying that they're both going to be OK. So I think there has been concern. Concern that nobody knew that Kate uh, had any medical issues. As I said, concern that this operation is going to keep her in hospital for two weeks and recuperating for a significant period of time, right up until Easter. So people are worried. And of course, behind the scenes, um, the royal family and the courtiers around them will be concerned because Kate being um, such a very popular member of the royal family, she does sprinkle some, some stardust everywhere she goes. She increases the popularity of the other members of the royal family. So to be losing your leading lady, if you like, will be of concern. And of course, in the next couple of weeks, they're actually losing the big three, which is uh, sometimes what Charles, Kate and William are referred to, with all three of them out of action. Yeah. Let's Let's talk about King Charles' health. We know he's been heading to the hospital to be treated for an enlarged prostate. You talked about the fact that they used to maybe surprisingly open. Why do you think the palace is being so open about his yeah. condition? Well, in fact, they said in the statement that uh, Charles had deliberately taken this decision to be really open about his condition in the hope that it would encourage other men to get themselves tested if they have prostate issues. We all know that men can sometimes be very reticent to seek medical advice. And I think Charles really is making a statement here saying, if I, the king, can be open about this issue, can admit that I'm you know, having these problems and I'm going to get treatment, then please can everybody, uh, if you have concerns, go and get checked. And, and it is a problem here. In the UK, particularly um, uh, black men are very, very prone to prostate problems um, and are even more reticent, the statistics show, uh, to get help. So I think it actually really was very admirable that he took this decision and this stance. Motivate a lot of other people to check on issues Absolutely. that maybe they haven't been checking on yeah. as well. All right. Daisy McAndrew, thanks for joining us this morning. Exactly. We appreciate it. Well, we've got much more to come here on this hour of Morning News Now, including the FAA widening its probe into Boeing in the wake of that terrifying midair blowout on one of its planes, when we could see one of Boeing's most popular jets back in the skies. But first, there is mounting pressure in Washington to bring those hostages held by Hamas back home, with some of the families expected to visit the White House today. Those stories and more up next. Welcome back. Well, later today, the families of some of the hostages still being held by Hamas in Gaza are meeting with U.S. officials in Washington in a bid to keep their loved ones in the spotlight. It comes after Hamas agreed to deliver medication to the hostages in exchange for Israel allowing aid for Palestinians suffering in Gaza. NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell has the latest. Good morning, Savannah and Joe. Well, American and Israeli hostage parents are in Washington. They are seeking answers from Washington officials today, expecting to see the national security advisor at the White House, and fearing that the world is moving on while attention on their sons and daughters is fading. A cargo plane of hope for hostages in Gaza. The first delivery of medicine and food for them from Qatar, agreed to by Hamas in exchange for more aid to Palestinian civilians. Here at home, hostage families holding a vigil Wednesday night at the U.S. Capitol and planning to visit the White House today, trying to keep the spotlight on their loved ones, now held captive for more than 100 days. A week ago today, we stood on the border with Gaza, so close to Omer. We screamed his name through huge speakers. Omer, can you hear us? We're here. We're really close to you. 
Omer Nutra is an all-American 22-year-old born and raised in Long Island. Love sports. What's his favorite sport? Basketball and volleyball. His parents emigrated from Israel 24 years ago. Their families, Holocaust survivors. When Omer decided to take a gap year before college and enlist in the IDF, they supported him. Basically understood that uh, he can't just be a bystander and he, he needs to join them and, and do his share. Were you afraid of the danger? Yes, but we could never imagine this situation. No one did. On October 7th, Omer was stationed along the Gaza border. He was in his tank with his team and they were ambushed. They forced them out and they took them. We are pressing for action uh, from anybody that we see, whether it's the State Department or FBI or uh, Israeli authorities. Many hostage families are now demanding that Israel agree to a ceasefire. It's been too long, it's too dangerous. Whatever they've achieved so far, they can continue doing that other, uh, after they bring them out alive. Leaders in Qatar have said that hostage negotiations have resumed with Qatar relaying proposals between Hamas and Israel's spy chief and the director of the CIA. But so far, no breakthroughs, while the families can only hope that their loved ones will be free before another 100 days. Savannah and Joe. Andrea Mitchell, thank you very much. The war in Gaza is sparking acts of violence and aggression here in the U.S. In Vermont, three college students of Palestinian descent were shot and seriously wounded in November. Authorities are investigating it as a possible hate crime. NBC News now anchor Tom Yama spoke exclusively with two of those victims about their experience. The headline stunned the nation. Three college students likely targeted and shot because they were Palestinian. And also where it happened, a neighborhood in Burlington, Vermont, now one of those students who was severely injured in the shooting is speaking out and telling me about the moment his life changed and how he's coping with his new reality. I just remember gunshots and falling down. For the first time, Hishem Awartani, the Palestinian-American college student who was shot and paralyzed, is telling his story. How he and his two friends were ambushed on a November night in Burlington, Vermont, he says, because of racism. Growing up in Palestine, this is something that I'd already, uh, I'd always thought was possible. But did you think it happened here? Not really, no. I, I definitely expected it, it would happen to me in like, the West Bank in Palestine, but not in Vermont. Hishem and his two best friends, Kinan Abdal Hamid and Tassin Ali Ahmed, all grew up together in the West Bank, doing everything together, including going to college in the U.S. With the war raging, the friends decided to stay with Hishem's family in Burlington during the Thanksgiving break. Hisham's uncle was driving us from Bowling Alley, and before we went into the house, we decided to walk around the blocks, what we usually do. Tahsin and I were both wearing uh, the kufiya, like the traditional Palestinian headscarf, uh, for a variety of reasons. Practically, because it was really cold, but on a more, like, you know, meaningful sense, it's because that we felt, as Palestinians during this time period, it's important for us to show our identity and to show that we exist and that we're human. Just walking along the street, you know, this man comes down the porch, approaches us, pulls out a pistol. Tahsin was screaming when he was shot first. He shammed, didn't make a sound, was run. As soon as Tahsin started screaming, I was running. Did you know you were shot? I didn't quite process the fact until I like looked at my phone and I saw my phone had blood on it. I was like, oh, I had been shot. All units be advised the shooters unaccounted for. The next day, federal agents arrested 48-year-old Jason Eaton, who lived steps from the shooting and had an arsenal of weapons in his apartment. He allegedly told the authorities who arrested him, I've been waiting for you. Eaton has pleaded not guilty to attempted murder charges. Why do you think he shot you? Uh, systematic dehumanization. People would like to focus on him as an individual. Oh, he's just this one evil guy. But the truth is he's a symptom of a larger issue. The bullet that hit Hishem struck his spine. Now paralyzed, he's learning how to navigate his new life. When they told you what your future may look like, or at least what the immediate future would look like, what was that moment like? I mean, yeah, it's definitely like something that's hard, but I take solace in the fact that I'm able to receive this care. It makes me think of like other people in Gaza who, you know, have been disabled by like bombings and like they are not able to receive that. I know that my life will continue, but I don't know about theirs. 
So far, the suspect in this case, Jason Easton, has not been charged with a hate crime. The state attorney in the case has said there is no doubt this was a hateful act, and they are still investigating the crime. In right. New York, Tom Yamas, back to you. Thank you, Tom. Let's get you more international headlines now. Officials say an explosion at a fireworks factory in central Thailand has killed several people. NBC's Claudio Lavanga has that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Joseph, and a good morning. That's right. Officials in Thailand said that at least 20 people were killed and three others are missing after that explosion in a fireworks factory in Thailand. Well, now local police said that about 20 to 30 workers were in the factory at the time of the blast and the death toll is expected to rise. The incident took place in a town about 60 miles north of the capital, Bangkok, and comes ahead of celebrations of the Lunar New Year when fireworks are in strong demand in Thailand and other parts of Asia. Police said that another explosion at the same factory in November 2022 killed one worker and injured, and injured three others. Thailand's National Disaster Agency said the cause of the explosion is under investigation. Let's now go to Russia, where on Wednesday protesters clashed with riot police in the uh, Bashkortostan region near Kazakhstan after a local activist was sentenced to four years in prison for his campaign against mining of a mountain considered to be sacred by locals. Videos posted on Telegram show riot police dispersing the crowd using tear gas, flash grenades and batons. Other videos show the demonstrators throw snowballs at the police with, while chanting freedom and shame. According to independent Russian monitor groups, about 20 people were detained, detained by the police, a claim that cannot be independently verified by NBC News. And let's end this tour of the world in Denmark, where the new king, Frederick X, has published a book to the surprise of many. Frederick was crowned king on Sunday after his mother, Margaret II, abdicated on New Year's Eve after 52 years on the throne. His book, called The King's Ward, is flying off the shelves in Denmark and gives an insight into his life and beliefs. In it, he reveals that, as a child, he had difficulty accepting he will become king of Denmark one day, saying he just wanted to be like all the other boys his age. Well, he didn't. Back to you guys. <laughs> yeah. I was cranked out that book real quick there. <laughs> yeah, I know, a surprise. <laughs> good for him, good timing. All right. Yeah, hopefully there's more. I love the story of him and his wife. So yeah, maybe we'll, we'll get more of that. I hope so, yeah. Claudio, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, new details this morning on the 10-year-old Maryland boy who was bitten on the leg by a shark while vacationing in the Bahamas. After the break, more on his condition this morning and the investigation now underway into what went wrong. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. This morning, we are learning new details about a shark attack at the Atlantis Resort in the Bahamas. The 10-year-old boy who was bitten while participating in the resort's Walking with Sharks experience is reportedly recovering, while the tour operator promises a thorough internal investigation. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has the latest. Doctor's Hospital in the Bahamas tells NBC News that 10-year-old child is recovering well this morning after surgery to his right leg and is expected to fly home to Maryland. That, as a family's tropical vacation, ended up in trauma. This morning, the popular Walking with Sharks experience at the Atlantis Resort in the Bahamas is closed and no longer available for booking on the resort's website. Just days after a 10-year-old boy from Maryland was bitten on his leg, the tour operator, Blue Adventures by Stuart Cove, writing in a statement, We are deeply saddened that a child suffered a shark bite during an in-water experience on Monday. The company says it's begun an internal investigation, adding incidents like this involving interactions with marine life, even with the species of sharks included in this experience, are rare and never acceptable. Michael and Tori Massey say they were in the water when the child was attacked. It was like just a very surreal moment, um, like nothing else I've, I've ever experienced. As multiple videos posted to social media show, the Shark Tank experience is part of the Mayan temple area of the resort's Aqua Venture Zone. Guests use special helmets in order to breathe underwater and to get close-up views of Caribbean reef sharks and nurse sharks. Neither are considered an aggressive species of shark. An ad on the resort's website, which has since been removed, said no swimming experience necessary to participate. But kids must be at least 10 years old. Blue Adventures by Stuart Cove say they've been operating this experience since 2006 and have never had a guest-related incident occur. NBC News reached out to the Atlantis for comments, but so far has not received a response. 
The Massey say the experience started out fine, but took a turn when the boy entered the water. When you go to a resort of this nature, you expect that safety is paramount and you expect there to be certain protocols. The couple says the dive guides in the water reacted quickly to the danger. A popular and long-standing attraction now on hold indefinitely. And according to the hospital, the boy and his parents, who were not actually in the tank when all of this happened, should now be back home safely in Maryland. As for commenting on this terrifying ordeal, we have not heard from them yet. You'd have to imagine there is some sense of relief now knowing that their son is going to be okay. Mm, Sam Brock, NBC News. Mm. Back to you. Thank you, Sam. Boeing is still in the hot seat as both the FAA and Alaska Airlines inspectors head into their manufacturing plants to review its quality control process. This comes nearly two weeks after the midair emergency that tore the door plug off a plane. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has the latest. Yeah, good day. The FAA says it has no timeline for when it might have allowed the MAX 9 to fly again. That's all pending its ongoing investigations. What's new is that now the FAA says the first 40 inspections of the grounded planes had been completed. The FAA is reviewing that data of those inspections before it then decides how to allow the next group to be inspected and when that might happen. So this is very much a, a, a work in progress, and there is no timeline here. Importantly, uh, only after reviewing that data will the FAA move forward with its decision on how it's going to investigate the rest of the grounded MAX 9s. Now, you're going to recall it was the door plug on that uh, Alaska Airlines flight, that door plug that covers up uh, an unused emergency exit that blew out in flight over Portland almost two weeks ago right now. The NTSB lab in Washington is now investigating how that door plug exploded out of the plane and whether it was properly attached. All 171 Alaska and United MAX 9s remain grounded, uh, and that means that both airlines have had to cancel hundreds of flights a day, about 150 a day. Alaska flights, about 200 United flights a day canceled because they don't have this critical plane uh, in their arsenal, if you will. Uh, underscoring the loss of airline confidence and trust in Boeing, Alaska has now decided to put its own inspectors in Boeing plants to double check Boeing's work, to double check Boeing's work. Here's the Alaska CEO speaking to passengers in a Twitter release. We will enhance our own quality oversight of Alaska aircraft on the Boeing production line, adding more experienced professionals to the teams that validate work and quality on the production line for the 737. Now, you'll recall it's not just Boeing. Spirit Aerosystems is also in the spotlight. Spirit makes the fuselage for the Boeing MAX 9 that ships it on to Boeing. Spirit has had quality control issues for years. The NTSB says that that door plug was actually made by a Spirit operation in Malaysia. Spirit says it remains focused on quality control, but yesterday Boeing's CEO visited a Spirit plant in Wichita and said both companies have got to up their game, double down on, in fact, ensuring that every piece that is produced for a plane is of great quality and they maintain their quality assurance standards across the board. But both companies, Boeing and Spirit, are right now just under enormous scrutiny with reputation at stake and a lot of people, a lot of airlines losing confidence in the Boeing product. Back to you. All right, Tom Costello, thank you. Well, as the frigid winter weather pummels the country, it's not only disrupting road and air travel, it's also taking a toll on furnaces. The single digit temperatures now causing calls for HVAC repairs to spike. NBC News reporter Patrick Fazio from NBC Chicago has some tips on how to avoid costly repairs. I'm going into houses that are sometimes as low as 30 degrees. HVAC specialist Pedro Sanchez is working 16 to 18 hour days to fix heating systems that broke down in this frigid weather. They need to get that up and running before we get any busted pipes or plumbing scenarios. And now a simple repair becomes thousands of dollars. I believe the furnace is eight years old, so hopefully it lasts a little bit longer. Alberto Moreno of Berwyn called for help when his kids noticed the house getting colder. The thermostat was dropping. My older ones, uh, you know, they were wondering what we were going to do if, if, you know, if it did continue to drop and get a little colder. 
It turned out to be a broken flame sensor, but Sanchez says it's not always a repair that's needed. Make sure all the vents are open. Sometimes people will close vents because they want to force air to go another area, and now my furnace is overheating because it can't breathe. He also recommends changing your air filter every 30 days, especially when the furnace is working harder during the coldest months. So check your air filter to make sure it's nice and clean. When the air filter is dirty, it's going to cause our furnace to basically run at a very high temperature and overheat. A smart thermostat can alert you to problems if you're out of town and it's hardwired so you don't need to change batteries. And keep your thermostat at the same temperature when it's this cold, says Sanchez. It's easier to go up one degree and then when it gets colder outside, not only are you trying to go up one degree, you're fighting the temperature that's dropping outside. So it puts much more strain on the system. Tips to keep you warm and save you money. Our thanks to Patrick Fazio for that report. And the extreme temperatures are also impacting our wildlife. In Texas, many sea turtles were rescued and sent to a facility for rehabilitation. We get that story from Sydney Hernandez with our NBC affiliate KBEO. Winter weather has officially come to South Texas. Sudden drops in air and water temperature can cause sea turtles to go into a hypothermic shock known as cold stunning. At which time our emergency response team, our staff here at Sea Turtle Inc. will intake those animals, take a good allocation of their current health condition, their current status, and then these bins by the end of the day will be full or overflowing with cold stun patients. The cold stun turtles will rest, allowing their body temperature to regulate. It's not overly warm in this room. Um, you know, sea turtles are cold blooded, um, so they use ambient temperature and water temperature to regulate their, bo their body temperature. So it'll be our responsibility over the next two to three days to really protect them and give them an opportunity to, to do what their body will do naturally. The turtles will then be released back into the water. For now, they already have rescued some, but staff is preparing for more. As for how many? The cool thing about turtles is that you never know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, we can predict with the weather and the wind and all of that kind of thing um, that we will definitely have some more. We think maybe tomorrow there will be um, even more than today, definitely. Um, we got some um, maps and some models in from NOAA and from our um, organization as well. Um, and those things are telling us that this will be more similar to some cold stunning that we had in the beginning of 20. 22. Um, so that's like a roughly around 100 patients. Our thanks to Sydney Hernandez for that report. Good to see those mm -hmm. turtles are getting the help they need. Oh. They're so cute. All right, coming up, we are diving a little deeper into our habits on social media with new concerns over the algorithm. Yeah, it's what creates your particular experience on the apps, but critics are quick to point out it can lead you down some dark rabbit holes and pretty quickly. So now some public figures are calling for make more regulation. We'll tell you about it next. We're back now with some breaking news on America's job market. CNBC's Silvana Hanau is here with the latest numbers and some other headlines that could impact your wallet. Hi, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yeah, so we're just getting some fresh news on the U.S. economy. Jobless claims indicating ongoing tightness in the labor market. So first-time filings for unemployment benefits, those came in at 187000 for the week ending January 13th. That's down 16000 from the previous week and below estimates for 208000 Google CEO Sundar Pichai is warning employees of more job cuts this year. In a memo seen by CNBC, Pichai says the company has ambitious goals and will be investing in big priorities such as AI. He says to make that a reality, Google has to make tough choices. The company has undergone several rounds of layoffs that started a year ago when it announced it was cutting 12,000 jobs. Nearly 40% of millennials and Gen Zers believe they face a more difficult time in building wealth than their parents did at the same age, and it's due to the economy. In a new report from Bankrate, more than a quarter of those age groups have considered or are pursuing alternative measures to grow their finances. Those include asking for a raise or hunting for a new job. Younger generations are also more likely to say they're contributing more to their retirement accounts, guys. Oh, I guess good. it's good news that, you know, you're contributing more to your retirement, but it is tough. It's, it's a tough environment right now. Yeah, it is, gosh. but it's good. Do it young, even if it's just a little bit. It right. adds up down exactly. the road. Exactly. Right, so Every little bit helps. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, according to one estimate, social media users will spend four trillion hours scrolling this year. But what we see on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok can go from funny and harmless to dark and scary in just a few clicks. That's creating concern among critics and increasing calls for government regulation. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward looks at where these algorithms are taking us. From puppies mood. to new dances to memes, Americans average more than two hours a day scrolling content, fed to us through algorithms based on our specific interests and past online activity. But a growing chorus of critics warns that algorithms can lead us to disturbing places and to making bad choices. These algorithms, uh, they are the digital equivalent of AR-15s. Some public figures are demanding regulation. They ought to be banned. They really ought to be banned. It's an abuse of the public forum. This TikTok user highlighting some of that criticism. I don't actually care about this kind of content. Well, if you care so little, why were you poking around in the comment section then? So how effective are these algorithms? Think about it this way. A grocery store like this one only knows what you are interested in once you've bought something. But a social media company knows every time you pause, even for a moment, to look at anything. And it constantly reorganizes the store to be more attractive to you. And that's why algorithms earn companies billions each year. But they can also lead us astray. In just three clicks, I can go from date night ideas to mind control seduction. China has censored social media for years, and the EU recently passed laws guaranteeing people the right to opt out of algorithms. Both sides of the aisle here have taken up the question of regulation, but no new laws have emerged. Why is the U.S. so far behind? It just becomes a De definitional issue. So what people will say is, oh, we disagree on the specifics of regulation. We don't want it to be overbroad. But in reality, people are afraid of crossing powerful interest groups, business groups, technology lobbyists. That leaves us to figure it out ourselves. You can limit your exposure by turning off the algorithm in Facebook and Instagram. YouTube says research has found its recommendations just reflect our preferences, but you can turn off autoplay and stream without signing on, which prevents the app from tracking you. And TikTok? Well, you can reset the algorithm if you don't like what it feeds you. So I think it's important to recognize that, yes, we have some agency, but also these systems are constantly making decisions. Until some national standards emerge, it is you against the algorithm. Our thanks to Jake Ward for that, and he has some tips for us since it is you against the algorithm. Is there anything you can do to avoid that insidious content? Well, the algorithms try and figure out what you will grab onto emotionally, even if it is offensive. So the longer that you watch, even if you pause for just a second, the more likely it is that you are going to get more of that. So be cognizant when scrolling through your feeds. Well, coming up, you could call it a sign of the times. After the break, why the feds are now cracking down on all those quirky and creative highway messages on those changeable signs. It was your blanca. <laughs> <Stay with us. laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. We have good news for all you grown-ups who miss playing at Chuck E. Cheese. I'm not sure how large of a population that is, but this one's for you. The restaurant and entertainment center chain is working on a game show for adults with a TV company. According to a release, the show will feature two teams playing against each other in super-sized games like pinball, air hockey, and the human claw. The team that wins will be able to exchange their tickets for prizes at the Chuck E. Cheese prize wall. Magical Elves, the production company behind Top Chef, says the show will tap into nostalgia for the brand. A premiere date and network have not yet been announced. I'm wondering if the creepy giant animatronic Chuck E. Cheese is included, as well as the fabulous pizza. You <laughs> Hopefully the pizza. Yes. <laughs> That's all we can hope for. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Savannah. Yeah. Finally this hour, you may have seen the humorous, witty messages on those changeable electronic highway signs, like, who hates speeding tickets? Raise your right foot. That message has been seen in a few states, including Delaware, the same place that reminds you to Delaware your seatbelt. Well, soon those types of messages on signs, well, they won't be allowed. That's because the federal government is calling for simple, direct, brief messages. No funny stuff. Even when traffic is turbulent, the highways can be poetic, lined with messages like, don't be a stinker, use your blinker. 
courtesy of Nevada. Here's the Massachusetts version of that bulletin. I'll spare you my Boston accent. Such clever missives flashing on those changeable electronic signs are popular ways for states to encourage good driving behavior. Four eyes in Mississippi, two eyes on the road. And from Ohio, visiting in-laws? Slow down. Get there late. This hit movie motivated New Jersey to write Hocus Pocus, Drive with Focus. Well, Arizona drew inspiration from Notting Hill. I'm also just a girl. The interstate translation, I'm just a sign asking a driver to use turn signals. The examples are numerous, but that's about to change. The Federal Highway Administration just issued new rules banning messages with popular culture references that are intended to be humorous, saying they might be misunderstood or understood only by a limited segment of road users and require time to process or understand. It's not going to be distracting to me to read something and go, huh, that's weird, I don't get it, and move on with my life. Lise Riker lives in Arizona, which has an annual safety message contest. 3,700 entries were submitted last year, including Riker's winning phrase, seat belts always pass the vibe check. I love them. And I think keeping your mind active while you're driving is important. Whether such messages are good because they engage your brain or bad because they're distracting is still up for debate. Regardless, soon they'll be gone. Hopefully you'll still keep your hands on the wheel, not your meal. <laughs> Even though the new rules are technically in effect as of today, the federal government is giving states two years to comply, so you still might see those messages. Arizona's DOT says it's still in the process of reviewing the new rules and has nothing to say about them right now, while Texas's DOT actually told us every message it posts includes a safety component and it will continue to do that. So perhaps some states might push the limit here, keep using the funny signs. We're going to have to wait and see what happens. You were laughing at a bunch of oh, them. Oh, I was cracking up. Yeah, oh, my gosh, fun. I wish you but read them all would it distract you from driving? That's the question. I don't think so. And you brought up a good point about just a billboard. Billboards or any advertisements there. that you take a yeah, second to read. I, I will say, I didn't. some of them I have seen on the road I don't totally get. But it doesn't mean that right. I can't continue <laughs> driving my car. Exactly. So, well, <laughs> I don't know. Federal government says them. no, so we'll I see what happens. I have kind of thought before, like, I can't believe, like, when they're, like, borderline inappropriate you know i'm like i can't believe that's allowed <laughs> they did that. not like i can't believe i have to read these words but just like, like wow to, who has the power here we have to cancel here? the dot yeah. all right <laughs> exactly all right that's gonna thank do you. it for this hour of morning news now and thank you throughout this show for not sparing us your boston news ya blinka stay with us the news continues right now Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.